Well, guys, let me tell you about the next, our next guest. He works at Reverb. So Reverb is the largest online marketplace dedicated to buying and selling old, new, and vintage musical instruments. Reverb was acquired by Etsy, which I think a lot of you will know here in Brazil, Etsy, you know, the largest marketplace for vintage and crafts, in 2019 for 275 million American dollars. The revenues in 2021, the first half of 2021, topped $1 billion, which is 65% increase year on year. So I think it's fair that we can say that Reverb is doing really well, really well. So I'll let him talk about his role, his job title, his experience. We're, I'm going to ask him about that. So I would just like for you guys to give a massive round of applause for our next guest, Brad Ford Showhammer. Please, Brad Ford. Thank you. Welcome. Sorry about the English. Um, I apologize in advance. I've been to Brazil many, many times, and I. I'm too busy going out and eating than, rather than learning the language, so I apologize uh, in advance. It's absolutely advance. fine, it's absolutely fine. So you've been in Brazil a few times, right? Many times. Okay. I'm dating a, a Brazilian, so I'm here almost every month. Amazing. So Amazing. When I got the call, do you want to come do this? I was like, of course, yes. Perfect, <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> Fantastic. So as I said, I think the first, just so we can get, give a like, kickoff, Tell us a little about, about yourself, your career, your, your background. Sure. sure. I, I have a pretty crazy background. I mean, um, I've kind of done it all in e-commerce, and I had no intention to ever work in e-commerce. I spent my 20s kind of wondering what I wanted to do. I was lost. I was a PR agent. I, was, I worked in radio. I worked in college admissions. And I decided to go back to school in my 30s. And I went to Parsons and got a fashion design degree because I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. And then I got this call from a friend of mine and he said, do you want to start a company? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And um, we started this company. It was called Fab.com. We founded it in 2008. Um, it skyrocketed. We went from two guys in a room to 700 employees. You old timers, maybe some of you will remember it. No one young knows what it is anymore, but it was valued at a billion dollars. We raised $330 million, and then I watched this thing that I gave birth to crash and burn, and it was like both the most awesome and most humbling experience of my life, but it just set this stage that, oh, e-commerce is where I belong because I am like a crazy shopper. I have almost 700 pairs of sneakers, I have a thousand toys, I have a thousand pieces of vinyl, I am like a crazy obsessive collector. Um, and, um, and so now I've found my way. So I've done a few other things since founding a company. I sold, founded another company called Bizarre and sold it to an Australian company. Um, I worked uh, for eBay for seven years, um, which is where I kind of scaled working for a big company. Um, at eBay, my title went from being the chief curator which was this made up title that didn't make any sense, to I ended up running the largest product organization when I left last month. So I left eBay last month. Um, I was running the whole buyer experience. So if you touched anything as a buyer on eBay, my teams built it, designed it, imagined it, uh, created it. Um, and then um, I got a call from uh, the Reverb folks. I had spoken a couple years ago to the CEO of Etsy. We have, he's an old eBayer as well. and. Um, at Reverb was looking for a chief product officer, and so I said, I love music, I love marketplaces, and it was time to maybe do something on a little smaller scale, although a billion dollars is kind of big, but compared to eBay, it's, it's a smaller scale. Um, and so that's, I've, been, I've been at Reverb now for uh, a month, not even, like I'm on my so third early days, week. Early days. Yes, early days. Well, from a customer experience, I can tell the Reverb is absolutely fantastic, because I, I play the guitar and I, I've, I've been using Reverb for actually too much. That's I sat my, next to dinner at this guy. As my wife she, 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 she tells me all the time you should spend less time at Reverb. Y you will love this. I, last night we had a dinner for some of the speakers, and I sat next to a guy, and his, on his name card it said Fender was his last name. And he's Fender. literally a descendant <laughs> of, the, of the Fender family. I don't know if he's in the room, but I sat next to a guy who's uh, related to the guy who created The largest it. brand in guitar making history. Well, we're here to talk about personalization. So 
tell us why personalization is important. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, McKinsey did a study, I think last year, where basically consumers, um, global consumers said this. The seven, over 70% of them assume and expect a personalized experience from e-commerce platforms. Um, uh, they don't want to do the work. And as equally uh, important is nearly as many of them said um, they get pissed off, can I say pissed off? Pissed off, annoyed when someone doesn't personalize the experience. So at this point, it's just table stakes. If you're in the game of selling things online, especially as more and more marketplaces spring up, and the great thing about marketplaces is the inventory is vast and, keeps, and, 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 is, and is large in number, um, you need a way to cut through what the customer needs um, and, and, and anticipate their needs and personalization is the way to do it. And how, how do you see personalization um, helping level the playing field across online and offline? Yeah, I, this is something that I tell my teams all the time. I think um, e-commerce is not that hard. Um, regular commerce, meaning a shop owner and someone that walks into it has existed since the day of time. Like, it's, it, it's always been there. And so I don't know why we don't think of building e-commerce experiences and products in the same common sense way of saying, would this make sense in a store or would this not make sense in a store? For example, you go into a store, you, you, you see someone over and over again, a salesperson, a, a store manager, a, a restaurant manager, they eventually get to know you and then say, hey, you should try this glass of wine, or hey, we got this in your size, or hey, can you call me when this goes on sale? Um, and um, that's like the awesome opportunity of e-commerce, and that's what personalization can do. It can essentially replace like the human being that has a real connection and remembers people, and then delight people and help them on their journey. Um, and it's just basic kind of retailing 101, if you ask me, uh, when you think about it. It's like, think about your favorite store, your favorite restaurant, the favorite physical brick and mortar place you walk into. Like, that's what I'm hoping that in the experiences that my team build that we try to, uh, to emulate. And additionally, you can never walk into a store that had one billion, eBay had 1.5 billion products for sale when I ran the buying experience. That's insane, that's insane. Imagine, no human can walk into a store. They can't even sift through a hundred things, let alone a billion things. So not only is it like an awesome opportunity to delight someone, it's also just you need to do it because the customer should not have to do that much work to find what they're looking for. Actually, that's one of, one of my questions to you today. And I think we just touched on that point, but I'll, 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 I'll say this, that you know, marketplace, especially like eBay, you just mentioned eBay, like Etsy and even Revolve, these guys have hundreds of thousands of millions, as you said, just a billion SKUs, right, products. And we consumers, we, we don't have the, 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 the tools to be able to navigate, to browse, to find what we need, what we need, what we want, unless you can give us that experience. You have the experience that will allow me to find what I need, what I'm looking for. So how do you, how do you Think about where brands can improve on that and using personalization. I mean, I, I think an easy no-brainer thing is that uh, folks need to stop thinking about um, that asking customers questions or literally engaging with them really in like in their in your face explicitly is friction or a bad thing. Um, I think that like personalization 101 1.0 was like. How do you serve up the most popular things? So you're looking at something and someone else and a hundred other people looked at it, and I'll show you that thing because but that's really that's lame. That's like great if you're like on Google and you're you like you want to find out where the restaurant is. Yeah, but but like, for ten years there, ten, fifteen years already. So we're super what's next, right? We're super unique beings. Like, unless you're selling diapers and, and batteries, which some of you probably are, so it's probably more of a, about um, the right price at the right time and quick. Like, most of the other things we consume, whether it's sneakers, art, home furnishings, fashion, are extremely personal. And I actually don't want an algorithm predicting what sneakers I want. So, more and more you see this, you see it all over the place, but, you know, the new norm is, to 
that to think that people are more than just what they're looking at in this moment, this week, today, and actually start to ask questions to the customer in engaging ways that can be seen as a dialogue as opposed to friction. Um, it's as simple as saying, hey, um, uh, do you like Adidas or do you like Nike? It's as simple as saying, you know, um, you know are you a left-handed guitarist or are you a right-handed exactly. guitarist? Exactly. And, and, and customers, um, you know, you can't take an Uber without saying, giving star rating. You can't get off a of Zoom without doing thumbs up, thumbs down. The expectation of a consumer today is they want to give information to get a better experience back. And like we can get down to a point where you can give like super explicit, specific information about price points and, and, and brands and designers and materials or whatever it is. Um, I think like that is the future, is to constantly have a question, a, a back and forth dialogue with customers. One other thing you have to do too, I think, is you have to give them the ability to tell you that they, you got it wrong. So it's one thing to collect signals and say, hey, what do you like? What do you want? Like, the other thing is you have to give them a way out if you got it wrong, like to say, hey, did we get it right? And many people don't think about the circle. They think about just the recommendation, and they don't think about that the recommendation has to come full circle. You have to confirm you got it right. Um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a as a as a as a company, and and so I, I think that like more and more you're going to see way more explicit conversations, explicit feedback, explicit questions, onboarding experiences that will just become the normal uh, the norm of shopping in any store online. Yeah, we always talk about and a lot of people will be willing to give out data and give you give out feedback, and I always believe that yes, if you as a brand you can really improve their experience based on that data. Because otherwise, then it's just a one-way road, right? I give you data, don't do anything with it. What's the point of it? Yeah, I, I, I use the word offensive. If you, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If, if, again, think about brick and mortar store. You walk into a restaurant every day and you order the same, um, I'm trying to think of a Brazilian dish, but I, I'm blanking, but you order the same thing every day. Like you literally order the same thing every day. And if like they bring you like the wrong thing every day, you'd be pissed off, it's annoying. So like you have to, if you're collecting the signal, you have to do something with it. Customers do not have appetite to give you information if you don't actually leverage it in the experience. Who do you see are the best in class with uh, asking customers about their needs and preference? Yeah, I, I think that the best, there's two worlds that I think of immediately. One is media. I think media has bested all the other um, all the other uh, e-commerce e industries. Like, think about Spotify, think about Apple Music, think about Netflix. Like, you literally tell them, like, the bands you like before they start saying, listen to this music. Like, that's not what most e-commerce companies do. Most e-commerce companies do, you show up and they're trying to sell you something. Like, that's a one in a million chance that I wanna buy that thing you're trying to sell me. So if you look at, like, the onboarding experiences of the media companies, by far, I'll, I'll do everyone in the game in my eyes. Like Spotify is a master class of, of onboarding and then constantly sh giving you enough of what you seed it, but then picking up new signals. So they learn what you're yeah. doing so they can keep giving you a better experience. And I think the other place that, that I think is, is the non-traditional commerce players, which are the social players, like Instagram and Pinterest, um, they really blur also you, you, you don't have an Instagram feed until you follow someone. You literally have to do, give a seed, and then it's, it's just stuff you like. And then they start to infiltrate that with things you can sell that are related to the things that you like, and they're really blurring the lines of like commerce and, and, and just consumption of, of media and content. Um, and like those, those two worlds, social and media, have really cracked like this, like, um, explicit dialogue with customers, in my eyes, way more than any kind of e-commerce company that sells like objects and things. That's, a, that's another one that I wanted to, to touch and ask you about that you just touched, which is social channels like, you know, Pinterest, Instagram, I think TikTok as well is, is in that group. Um, which ones, or, or which are now commerce platforms, right? We were talking about that before the, this, this, this opportunity here is, these guys have become commerce platforms, transaction platforms. Had, are these guys changing the game? Have others what? 
are they are they changing the oh, game, yeah, 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 the yeah, e-commerce yeah. game? Hands down. I think there's like, I, I, we talk about it a little bit at work, but I don't think people are like recognizing it enough. Like, the, gone is the construct of like a home page with a search bar. That's a great idea. That's going yeah. away. Like that is an old way of shopping. That's like archaic. Like it is it, the new way of consuming content and consuming things is through feeds. It's just through lazy scrolling, inspired content that's related to things I like. It's not trying to get me to buy this thing right now. It's trying to get me to stay there for hours of the day, consuming it. And then every once in a while, you win the right to get like the buy. And I really believe like that is the future of shopping. Maybe not so much for, as I said, more co commodity goods where yeah, it is yeah, you, yeah. you make a, lo a list of things to go to the grocery store and I need like, I need oatmeal, I need batteries, I need this. But like for anything that you're consuming that has any kind of like emotional or personal value and that's musical instruments, that's home goods, that's any fashion, fashion all of this cars, uh, all, all of this stuff. Um, I really believe that like, um, we are going to see very quickly, and we're already starting to see it. Like, eBay did it. Reverb has a feed. A feed, yeah. <laughs> uh, Etsy has a feed where, like, the new norm on shopping will be um, just content that's related to something deeper than me just than I was looking to buy this thing this week. Reverb's feed is my favorite feature because it's exactly what uh, he's just said is you build the feed based on what you want to see. And after that, you literally have an Instagram-like feed of the products that you like, the brands that you follow back within the, a marketplace. It's absolutely brilliant. And why I think it's like even more powerful potential opportunity for e-commerce companies is that there's all these attributes that you can apply to your feed that you can't do on social. Like you may say like, I, like literally you could say, I want to look at this guitar and this guitar and this guitar and this price point from this country only. And like you can get that specific about how you kind of curate these things. I think like that is the level of like the tooling, the control that we need to give consumers because even you don't want to look through like a bunch of guitars that you'll never buy. Definitely, uh, yeah. definitely. And, and so I think like it's super interesting i think there's probably a, a very unique opportunity um for anyone who's selling things um that again aren't commodity objects to like really double down on um letting customers tell you very specific things they're looking for at very specific price points at very specific colors whatever that is and then create like a really lazy browsing experience that's almost like it's like i'm not shopping almost i'm just consuming that's the mindset you want to get people into 100 percent, 100 percent. listen guys um i've got a few more questions for brad but i think we can also get questions from you from the audience if you have questions for brad as well um do we have microphones going around can one anyone send me a sign yes no do we have questions? Is Do we better? have questions? <laughs> Do we have microphones? Because I can, I, can, I can keep going. I can keep going. Well, why do we figure out? <laughs> Let's go back quickly to data. Sure, sure. Which types of data points um, are you able to collect from your, from your customers these days? And, and how do you think you should be using this to drive further engagement? Yeah, um, I, I think you know, there's a lot of talk about data everywhere. I think third-party data... Um, I'm less interested in as a, as a product leader. Um, I'm way more interested in, as I said, like what customers are saying to us or doing on our own platform than, than trying to like um, take third party data and try to decipher that into something meaningful. Um, so there's the obvious stuff. Like the first thing you have to collect is like basic information about the consumer, where they are. You can actually leverage that quite nicely in a country as big as Brazil, as big as the United States. Like, um, you know, if we know you're in Los Angeles versus New York and it's the, the, the winter, like that actually should play into kind of the things that you sell. So there's just kind of like basic data about demographics and where you live, et cetera, that could influence, could, um, what you show customers. I think uh, no-brainers are like you have to monitor what someone's looking for. Looking for. 
Like, if someone is in the hunt and they are searching for something and they've looked at something three or four times or they keep searching the same terms or they keep coming back to the same brand, like, that's just an opportunity. They are in the game. They are shopping for something right now. That is, like, what most, I think, people think of when they think of personalization. They think of... Um, I just want to convert that person in session, but I don't think that's the biggest opportunity. I think the bigger opportunity is to start to collect um, interests of customers. Um, and that could be something as generic as fashion. I like fashion. On a platform like eBay, it probably does make sense to understand if someone has an interest in fashion versus cars, because if someone's into fashion, you never want to show them cars. That's stupid. Um, and, but then you can get super specific, though, and start to collect kind of uh, interest. You may be interested in, um, I, you may be interested in guitars that the Beatles played. Yeah, yeah. And, like, that might be something that you want to understand, like, what were all the types of guitars that John Lennon used? And you want to try to collect, c capture that sound when you're making music at home. Like, that would be an awesome thing to collect if, if, if that data existed. Um, it could be art movements. It could be, um, you know, a specific sh sh style of shoe. Um, so it could be anything that you could have a general interest in. And then I think, like, then you, it, you have to go click beneath that. We call them traits at Reverb. Uh, we call them aspects at eBay. But um, there are things like color preference. People have color preferences. I mean, you might not wear an orange jacket ever, but you may like blue. Um, and you may like Nike versus Adidas as the classic one because, you know, most Nike, Nike people, they don't mix. It's like you're one, you're one camp or the other. Um, the, the Trace is something as simple as, you know, I'm never going to spend more than $25 on X item. So, like, price preferences are very important. Just any kind of attribute, size specifically when it comes to um, clothing or fashion, but like, you know, an obvious one that I didn't even know before I started working Reverb is that there's left-handed and right-handed guitarists. Like, duh. Like, I know that the left-handed guitarist is like a very small audience, but like, how offensive would it be if someone bought two or three left-handed guitars and constantly all you were showing them were right-handed guitars? Like, that's the kind of like uh, specific data that you want to capture and then honor on all, all touch points in the experience. At the end of the day, the more you know about your customer, the be better service you can offer, right? And there's something that Reverb does really well that I think is absolutely fantastic and it does make a lot of difference for someone that is shopping for something, any product, is by knowing where I am, when they, I search for something, the order of the products they show me from top to bottom, they start from the location I am as well. So if I'm in the UK, they will start shop, uh, showing me the results based on UK sellers first and then the rest of the Europe and then America and Brazil or other, other places. Because of course, it's it makes more sense for someone that is based in the UK to buy a product that is based in the UK because you've got shipping, you don't have to pay uh, importing taxes, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So just a little, of a, little bit of an intelligence based on one data point, which is yep. location. Yep. And, and if we do say, if we do realize that you, you're constantly buying guitars from America, though, maybe you're collecting a certain type that's not yep. readily available, yep. We should, all, we should also understand that and then default kind of those things. But you're right. I think, like, country of origin is, like, a no-brainer. Like, As a no-brainer. Yeah, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. And even regional. Like, one of the things, you know, we were just talking about it last night is, like, um, with my team, like, as I said, United States is really big. UK, less of a problem because you can pretty much ship anything in that country within lots a day. Smaller, lots yeah. smaller. Yeah. But, like, in the U.S., like... It, we, it needs, needs to be even more nuanced, like likely to be like the corridor that you live in because that's how quickly the shipping could happen. But it's also like how cheap the shipping can be for the seller. So if the seller ends up making more money, if they don't have to overnight something to California from New York, they're selling to someone local. It's super, super interesting. But yes, those are exactly the types of things that you have to, all of these things matter and they all have to go into one single data source and they all have to be accessed from whoever in your company is writing algorithms or building personalized experiences so that you're honoring those, uh, what you know about the customer everywhere, not just in one place, not just a home page or a search page or an email that you literally have to do it end to end all over the place. 100%. Moving forward, uh, which other parts of the business do you think or should or could be personalized? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, it's something that, you, you know, I, I saw 
firsthand about maybe five years ago. So in between founding uh, one of my companies um, and starting a new one, I had a really nasty non-compete. Um, and so I couldn't work in, uh, in any space. And I ended up working for a year as the chief design officer of this really awesome company called Backcountry. They're based in Park City, Utah. They're like the number one e-commerce company in the United States for uh, outdoor sports apparel. So carbon skis, backpacking, hiking stuff, like fly fishing rods, that kind of stuff. Um, Patagonia, North Face, those brands. Um, so I lived in Park City for a year. And I, very similar to Reverb, everyone that worked there was an outdoor enthusiast, like every single person. Like if you live in Park City, you probably are by design, but like everyone there is like a hardcore enthusiast. And one of the things that I got up close and personal with then was their customer service team, which they called gearheads, were specialized by sport. So if you called, and you were a skier and you had a problem with you got a cracked ski or you didn't know which ski to buy or et cetera, you would literally talk to someone who was an expert in that sport because not only is the service obviously better, but the potential for you to upsell or actually take service as a part of your business and actually turn it into a sales organization was like critical to their success and like is in the DNA of the company. Fast forward, you know, I'm working at eBay a couple years ago, and the threat to eBay all around the world are these very specific verticalized marketplaces. Reverb, musical instruments, StockX, sneakers, Etsy, handmade, you know, the list goes on, that goes on and on and on. And the great thing that each of those companies have is that they also are verticalized. And so I think like a huge threat for marketplaces that sell cross category will be how do you speak to a customer authentically who has a very specific interest that might be one just percentage of something that you sell on your platform. One way to do it is personalize the content and the items, but I think like what most people are not even scratching at the surface yet is I believe very strongly that your customer service will have to be category specific or interest specific or lifestyle or passion specific in order to compete in this day and age because the expectation is if I have a passion and I love something, I want to buy it from a community and a, and a retailer who speaks the same language as me. 100%, 100%. That's very interesting. So the last question I've got, if you guys, you guys have questions, please, this is the time. Oh, there's one. There's one. Do we have microphones? There's someone back there. Someone back there. This Ooh. reminds me of when I was a kid watching Oprah Winfrey all the time, where they'd run to the person in the Let audience. Check the time. How many time? How much time do we've got? Yeah, we've got. We've got a time for one question. At least one question for the public. Hope it's a good one. We don't have microphones, do we? <laughs> okay. So probably you can ask Brad when he finishes. Yeah. Good. So I'll, I'll shoot my last okay. one. Okay. Let me shoot my. Cool. So you're going to be hanging around for, for a while after sure. that. Yeah? yeah. So guys, if you've got questions for Brad, please look for him. As soon as we finish, he'll be happy to have a chat with you. My final one is about the pandemic. Oh, yeah. We talk about that, right? So how, how do you think the pandemic has affected e-commerce? And, and, and in specific, I think Reverb have, because I've heard I've heard that people are buying lots of music instruments back again. How do you see that? How do you think the pandemic has impacted e-commerce and yeah. people's behavior? Um, I got to witness it firsthand. I worked at eBay during the height of the pandemic. It was crazy. Like sales exploded, this like iconic platform, and suddenly you couldn't buy things here or buy things there. So people came back in droves to the platform, and I got to like watch the, the trends of what happened. And originally it was like traditional supply chain had collapsed, and people still needed a myriad of things in their life, and they turned to platforms like eBay and other um, marketplaces to just find the things that they needed. And then once kind of like supply chain stabilized, like the next theme that emerged that is not going anywhere, I'm convinced, is there was just a return to what I call nostalgia, where people were just like, 
People have a different opinion about what they want in the world now after the results. They had it when they were locked in their house and they were surrounded by all this stuff and they were really critical about, I need the things in my life that actually mean something to me. So we saw a huge, huge, huge increase and, and some of the, and some of the company, like the company I work for benefited from this, of people going back to things that made them comforted that made them happy, that made them feel like a child again. And so you saw things like comic books and trading cards and musical instruments and all these things that like were probably like hobbies as young adults. Adults went back to them in droves. And it's, it's not stopped. Like I think that like um, we realized that like time is precious. Um, there were things that really mattered to me, and I think that a lot of people went back to kind of their first love, which is like collecting, playing music, um, self-expression, um, and that's just something that I think, you know, the pandemic sucked, but like, I think it's actually a cool thing that did emerge from it is that more and more people became aware of, like, I wanna fill my home and consume things that actually are meaningful to me, not just for the sake of consumption. Absolutely, that's a massive opportunity right there, right? That we can, we can tap on it. Well, our, our time has finished, unfortunately. This has been a fantastic, fantastic conversation, Brad. Thank you so much. Um, I hope to see you again in Brazil soon. Thank you so much. Guys, Thanks, a big everyone. round of applause. Brad from Reverb. E aí, gostou do vídeo? Então não deixe de curtir e compartilhar. Aqui do lado tem duas sugestões que você pode gostar. Até a próxima!